You're listening to the No Schedule Man podcast with Kevin Bulmer, exploring real stories and lessons learned with a variety of special guests. To learn more about Kevin and to access other episodes of the podcast, please visit noschedulemen.com and connect and contribute at No Schedule Man on Twitter or Instagram and on Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud, all backslash No Schedule Man. Thanks for listening and enjoy the No Schedule Man podcast. I've been known to struggle with reality. Not that it is any real mystery. The question today is How do you want to be remembered? And if I asked you to tell your story in front of a camera, what would you say? Would you even be willing to do it? Well, that's been part of Melissa Shank's story ever since she was a little girl. Not only has she become an expert at telling her own story in a variety of ways, but she's made it a key part of her life's work to help other people and professionals step just outside of their comfort zone and in front of the camera in order to reach new levels of awareness and success and to create a legacy that lasts. Welcome, I'm Kevin Bulmer, and today we're exploring the journey of Melissa Shank. She is the creator of MS2 Productions, a high-impact video marketing agency. Melissa also works as a speaker, author, producer, and business consultant, among many other things. She's got a vast background in media that includes both radio and a long run as a television weather anchor. And Melissa certainly knows the landscape of media and broadcasting firsthand. Her creative passions and entrepreneurial instincts have continued to drive her forward into creating new and exciting ways to communicate and to help her empower others to do the same. What you're about to hear is a really fun story of an energetic, kind, and creative soul who's made an art out of trusting her intuition to explore the next idea and to be constantly focused on the possibility of what could go right as opposed to worrying about what might go wrong. Some of the key things I took from my time with Melissa include, number one, doing what can't be done. Melissa tells a terrific story about a camp that she created for kids in her radio days. She had a vision and an idea that she believed in, but she didn't have an existing model that she could just point to in order to get other people to understand what she was getting at. So she created it. And she gives some examples in our conversation of what happened as a result. Just never forget, especially in this monkey see, monkey do, copycat society, that the innovators... The creators and those who are willing to step out on a limb and trust themselves, trust their vision, are the ones who really stand to gain the most and to help others besides. Number two, you become like the people you spend the most time with. This came up in the context of her recognizing one of her mentors in TV broadcasting, a longtime weather anchor in this city, a guy named Jay Campbell. Now, the principle behind this idea, though, is much larger. You do tend to create a collective consciousness with the people you associate with the most. They affect you, and you affect them, whether you want to believe you do or not. If you want to start getting different results in your life, or reach a more successful, healthier, or creative plane, you may need to take a really hard look at the people that are around you the most. What their attitudes are, what conversation gossip and energy levels you're exposing yourself to the most and what you're contributing to keep it in mind it's an old saw it happens to be true at least in my experience and melissa says the same you become like the people you spend the most time with be vigilant about it and number three remember it's what i can do for you and not the other way around This comes up near the end of our conversation when she tells the story about how she landed inside the top 10 of a competition of more than 35,000 entries for Tourism Queensland's Best Job in the World competition. Now, 95% of the people took the tactic to say why they would be the best and why this organization should give them the job. What you can do for me. Melissa took a different approach, and it's a really fine example of one of the obvious things that any marketer can do to differentiate themselves, and that's understand that it's not about them. It's about the customer. This sounds like a very simple philosophy, but it's one that just about all of us, myself included, get wrong on a consistent basis. When we're talking about features and benefits and all the things that we think make us great, While that all might be true, we're not necessarily offering what that can do for the people that we're trying to help. 
It's not really about us. It's about them. It's about what I can do for you. Melissa got that right, and her story drives that point home really nicely. So listen for it. You're going to love this discussion with Melissa Shank. Here it is on the No Schedule Man podcast. Melissa, when you look up the list of things that people are most commonly afraid of, speaking and hearing their own voice on, (laughs) you know, recorded and seeing their own face, talking on video. These are all right high up there with snakes and spiders and heights, (laughs) but not for you. Where did your natural love of speaking and video and performance come from? Oh, that is a funny story. Oh, you know, but interestingly enough, I have thought about this a lot recently because my grandfather passed away last year and it was it was through him. He had a video camera and he would he would film us as a kid and so I had this fascination with the love of a camera at a very early age and then the the public speaking part of it just sort of followed also at an early age from even just doing the morning announcements to you know I guess I was the kid that that I wouldn't say I got in trouble for talking a lot, but I certainly did speak a lot. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, I, I would trace it back to my grandfather. I want you to, I'd like you to tell me more about that. And I'll tell you why it's kind of selfish. There are cassette tapes. I'm looking around actually, while I'm talking to you, trying to see if I've got one within reach called Gramps interviews. And my, mm. my grandfather on my mother's side, he always w- would have this cassette deck. And I'm talking about mid seventies, mid to late seventies. And every time we'd go and visit him, he would record an audio interview with it. And we still have a lot of that audio. He's long go- gone now, but oh, to be able to have that and be preserved. So when you say that your grandfather used to interview you, um, that just set off this lightning, <laughs> lightning bolt of emotion yeah, for me. But- Tell me more about what he used to do with you. Well, it wasn't so much the interview stuff. He never wanted to be in front of the camera. He was always the silent type, the behind the scenes kind of guy. But you know, I got him to star in some of my commercials. He was the guy that would say yes to me for anything. You know, uh, it was, we had a very, very special connection and he, he was in some of my commercials, but it was more or less, he always was the man behind the scenes, behind the camera. And it wasn't so much interviewing as it was just capturing the moments and the scenes. And I think Again, at a very early age, it just really struck me from, uh, you know, it it even goes back to I used to be a competitive swimmer, and many people don't know that about me. Um, But the drive, the the even performance in the water, and we filmed all of those at a very early age too, like six, seven, eight years old, and we have footage. Like I don't know what I maybe it's my take charge personality because even back then I would take a microphone and grab it out of someone's hand and talk about the races and what it was like. And, uh, in some ways I kind of kicked myself because one of the things I think I would have liked to have done would, was to do, was to do more sports commentating. But honestly, I was always afraid of botching people's names because, uh, you know, that's a big fault in, in broadcasting if you mess up somebody's name. But nowadays I used to think, wow, that's the one position that would last in broadcasting and surprisingly enough, even locally in London, they've, they've cut the sports down to like the newscast or 15 minutes. So I was wrong there, but, but uh, I, again, I just, I think I like to speak at a very early age. <laughs> so how did that start to weave itself into your experience as you were going through school and into high school and beyond? So I grew up in Stratford. So I have a very theatrical background. So that's part of that's part of it. But in high school, when a lot of my friends were going to school for theater, I'm always part of my personality is as everybody's going left, I'm going to go right. If everyone's going right, I go. I just I want to be different. I don't want to go with the pack. I sometimes maybe like to lead the pack, but uh, I wanted to be different. So instead of acting, I went into broadcasting. And actually, when I had applied to go to school, I signed up for the wrong program and I didn't realize it. I thought I was signing up for broadcasting uh, to be in front of the camera. And it turned out I signed up for television broadcasting, but it was all the production end, which actually turned out to be 
a fabulous gift because I learned and appreciated everything behind the scenes from producing, directing, to do the switching, to do the camera work, to lighting, to the audio, to you name it, the edit, you know, the, the, the everything behind the scenes from the tape feed, like all of that stuff. And it gave me not only a greater appreciation, but I always had an entrepreneurial hat too. So uh, when I finished school, I worked I worked in a toy store for a family and company for about eight, seven or eight years and beyond just past high school. And that also gave me a lot of wisdom and knowledge in what I do today with my own business. But I think the two, the entrepreneurial side and then learning all that behind the scenes, then I wanted to have my own business. And so I went into video production and then I could have the best of both worlds. I could speak. I could uh, do things in front of the camera, which I never actually went to school for. It was sort of... Um, Something I took, you know, I took courses for workshops, that sort of thing, but never actually went to school uh, per se and got a certificate for it. But to me, that was more the street smart stuff that I learned, uh, the hands on. And then I got the schooling for all the production, the behind the scenes, which allowed me to uh, to really appreciate and to know what to do in the business now with all the people I work with. Tell me more about the entrepreneurial instincts that you had, because you just you tossed a lot at me about, yeah, <laughs> about right. well, no, no, don't. I think it's awesome. But both sides of the, the TV camera and behind the scenes and in front of the scenes and working at a toy store and the theatrical background and um, your inclinations towards speaking and all that. But to, to, to haul it back, an entrepreneurial instinct, the way that I would take it, Melissa, would be some sort of an inherent idea or a murmur in your being that says, I can do my own thing, and like you said, if everybody else is going to go left, I'm going to go right. Entrepreneurs go right. They do, they don't you know necessarily buy into this whole script of how work and career life is supposed to go. But what did that look like for you in terms of how you started to recognize that as part of who you were? Uh, the first point, I think, was when I worked in radio, and I... It, again, I go back to high school and I used to, you know, listen to the local radio station and see them in town. And I thought I could do that job. So I applied to be the community cruiser reporter and see there, there right there was the love of speaking and the love of going out and, and talking about the events and things that were going on. That was kind of a pinnacle point, though, for me when I finally got that job. And I, I was that girl that just called up and picked up the phone every time. Hey, are you hiring this summer? Who's who are you hiring this summer for? So I think they just got fed up and I think they got fed up and gave me the job finally. Uh, but from there, then I actually got hired as a junior as a junior announcer. And but somebody later on went on mat leave. And so I went to my my news director or I went to the station manager and asked, Hey, what would you think if I went into sales and I covered this mat leave position? So it was sort of right there. I went from uh, tripling my income and it was sort of like, Oh, well, this is really interesting. And I had this love and fascination of marketing and sales. And I remember going through all the files of the person that I had taken over from laid them all out on the desk and I analyzed them. I, you know, I'm, I'm very creative, but there's that analytical side of me too, that looked at and to say, okay, what are these people doing now and how can I make this better? And so over the course of that time, I remember that year we increased, I increased sales by about 30, 35%, which was pretty significant in, in that Stratford market at that time. We're talking uh, quite a few years ago now, but uh, so that was a moment. But then from the entrepreneurial, I know it's taken me a little bit of time to get to that story, but the entrepreneurial part hit me because I realized that people needed more than just radio. And all I could give them was a radio ad. And I thought, no, but like you need this. this, this is before social media, but you need more, you need to be visible, you need this. So I thought, well, if I have my own business, then I can deliver anything I want, but I can deliver exactly what they need. Radio can be a fast, it can be a piece of that puzzle, but I want to be able to offer more. So that was the catalyst. But before then, I actually, I had started my business and then I went and worked on cruise ships for a little bit in sales. And, uh, and then I worked for a company in Chicago and audio visual production company. So it was really getting your feet wet and figuring out what do people need and as a, as opposed to what do I have to offer you? 
I, I feel compelled just to stop for a second and mention or, or maybe ask if you've always had this level of energy. Hopefully anybody <laughs> that's listening now and I'm going to tell, give some quick background, uh, understands that okay, you're going to want to buckle up here for the next 45 to 50 minutes or so because we're going to deliver a lot of content in a short amount of time because Melissa is here and it's, it's time to go. And I mean that as a compliment, but I'm smiling while I was listening <laughs> to how you just answered that last question, Melissa, as I'm oh. sitting with a, a cup of coffee <clears throat> and I'm getting some work done this morning of the day that we're recording this. And it's about, I don't know, 5.50, 5.55 in the morning, something like that. It wasn't yet 6 a.m. And my phone buzzes. And, <laughs> and I thought... Who in the world is texting me like somebody's been up all night because this is the time, this is my quiet time that I can really get some stuff. And it's Melissa. And it's just, hey, you know, are we connected for later on today? And everything is yeah, good. That, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Melissa's up before the, <laughs> you know, before the birds. Have you always been like that? Yeah, I'm a morning person. I am a hop out of the bed and I'm not a coffee drinker either. Like, it's really interesting. I'm kind of like that energizer bunny, but at the end of the day, my battery dies. Like I am, I, I shut down, but if I can get a few hours of sleep and then I am, I'm just like, boop, wake back up again. And away we go. The the secret for me seriously is I have to write everything down. I have to kind of have a plan of attack. It could change, but I have a plan of attack as to, you know, what do I want to accomplish the next day? Who do I need to connect with? What do I, I have to kind of visualize what that is like. So I knew we were going to speak today and I, and I wanted to make sure we were all connected and it's not last minute and, and that, but it's kind of having that plan in place and, and mentally kind of knowing where I'm going to go. As soon as I can get that out of my brain for the next day, I can sleep. And I, and I'm like fast sleep, boom, gone, out. <laughs> <laughs> How do you find, and I'm taking us on a bit of a tangent here, but don't worry, we can wander back anytime. I'm curious about with somebody with that much focus and drive and the amount of energy that you have and the ideas that you have, because you've described already for us, Melissa, a really vast perspective on different opportunities and how so many other people are just, you know, even considering whether they want to try to get A to connect to B, where you've got the whole alphabet connected in your mind. How does that translate into what you expect you can get done with a day, a week, a month, a year versus what you're actually able to get done? And how how do you balance that out? Oh, that's a crazy question. You know what? If you would ask me that two and a half years ago, I would answer it very differently because I have a two and a half year old now. So I was, I, you know, I still am kind of a workaholic, but it, Asher, my son has really changed me in the sense that before I, I was very, I mean, I'm still very driven, but I'm not a nine to five person. My life has never been a nine to five job and with Asher. So the reason why you got that, you know, that text so early in the morning is that's the quiet time. That's the time I can get up and I just have to get up a bit earlier now to have that focus. Um, and now it's it's all about being really smart with your time and then maximizing it and even setting time blocks and saying, okay, so this particular part, I think it should take me about an hour. And I really do kind of gauge and measure this. And sometimes, yeah, it takes me more um, creative projects, especially when you're trying to come up with concepts and write commercials for clients and things. But it's just about really maximizing that time. And then I do try now very, very hard to take time for family. And not that I didn't do it before, but I used to work seven days a week. I used to be, you know, MS2 through the week, but I was a weather anchor for like 12 years. So I would work evenings and weekends, not every evening, but weekends. I was a Saturday, Sunday weekend weather person. So I used to always like leave for work and, uh, and it was, so I'd miss family functions. I'd miss family holidays. And honestly, it wasn't until the past few years where like we're getting older now and people are passing away. People are not that were in your life are not there anymore. And it really hit me like a ton of bricks saying, what are you doing that, you know, I ask my clients, here's something interesting. I ask my clients, how do you want to be remembered? So I always start with the end in mind, whatever the creative project is, how do you want to be remembered? And then I work backwards and I thought to myself, well, how do you, how do I want to be remembered? And she was a really hard worker and dedicated to her job. And yeah, of course that's part of it, but uh, I've had to kind of take a step back and realize that, you know what, it, I'm actually more productive in some regards now taking a different route and not 
working and putting in all the hours that I used to because I'm even finding that sometimes when you take a little bit longer, not, and I don't mean to get back to someone, but just not answering those emails like right then and there, sometimes something changes and it actually saves you that you wouldn't have put in that work anyway um, because there was a shift or a change or something. So time can be actually very helpful, I think, in some ways, but uh, I still haven't mastered it yet. In the two and a half years, I, I'm not probably the expert to be speaking about that one. <laughs> Where do you think your sense of focus and discipline comes from? Uh I have a sister with special needs, so I think I grew up very, very quickly. My sister was born when I was three, and she had hypoglycemia when she was born, so she had a low blood sugar. Um, the doctors didn't find it out fast enough, though, so she was seizuring. We couldn't find; it. they couldn't figure out why. Um, there was it was basically an, an oversight, and so it caused damage to her brain. So mentally and physically, she is she or she will be. 38 this year and, um, or 37 this year. And she, mentally she's about the age of a four or five year old. So I was more of a mom than a sister growing up. So I think it just was, and, and it was never anything that my parents ever pushed me to succeed or to do. It was just really in me. And, and something growing up for me, I was always a perfectionist to the point that, you know, if there was a mistake on the piece of paper, this is kind of like pre- computers and, you know, like white out and stuff. I didn't even want to use white. I, it was kind of weird. Like, Oh, this isn't right. This isn't right. I got over it. And I realized, Oh my gosh, I was very lucky. I had a teacher that I had the same teacher in grade two and grade six, Mrs. Edmonds. And it was her that really straightened me out and was like, Melissa, what are you doing here? Life is really short. And she became a, like a, a lifelong friend. Uh, she's an amazing artist and I'm not, I don't have an artistic ability. I can't draw and paint. And I was always just so enamored by her talent. But when she would go to, here's a side story. When she would go to France and paint in the summer, I would look after her house for her when I was in high school. And it was just, I think again, being around that artistic community and I was around adults at a very early age, probably more. I, I didn't go to the parties. I didn't go to, I wasn't a loner or anything. I was a very social person. I just kind of figured out what was important to me. And, and, and again, I'm still not necessarily where I want to get to yet. But, um, but to me, it's about like using your time to the best of your abilities. And whether if that means relaxing is, is important to you or taking time for you is important to you. I mean, you got to do what you got to do. Right. So again, not an expert in it yet, but, but every day, every day getting a little bit better. Always trying to figure it out. Um, I, I want to go back to where we were a few minutes ago, where you were talking about some of the, the things that were part of your experience going off and working on a cruise ship, working in Chicago for a while. And it sounded to me the way you described that period in your life, Melissa, as you had a pretty solid idea in your mind that you were going to go the entrepreneurial route or that you were in the process of going there, but that you also allowed it some time to kind of develop on its own time and learn some things along the path. How accurate or fair is, is that to observe? Yeah. You know what though, too, I would always have these sort of crazy ideas sometimes, or I would see something. And every time somebody would say to me, like, there's no way you can do that. Or that is so not going to happen. I would just figure out a way to make it happen. <laughs> so, and it even started, like I, even in radio, there's, there are some really pivotal memories that about three or four different things in my life that I go, wow, I'm so glad I did this. And it's a lifelong lasting memory. The first one was even, well, from a sales entrepreneurial point of view, I, I, remember being in radio and working in sales and thinking to myself, and this may be weird, but I was thinking to myself, how, okay, I don't know how to explain it, but like, how can you make money off of your listeners? Isn't that terrible? <laughs> how, can you no. make, how can you make money off of the people that are listening to the radio? And I thought of myself as like, okay, so then I'm thinking of wouldn't it be amazing if kids could have an experience and to know and to like, in, like try it before you buy it. So if you were going to go to school for radio or television, wouldn't it be great if you could taste it and get a sense and get your feet wet in it before you actually did it? So I decided, and I went to the program director again, that I wanted to create a kids camp. Uh, 
and it was called Little Mike's Broadcasting Fantasy Camp for Kids. And we, I made it into a three-day camp. And it was a Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And I went out and got sponsors because who doesn't want to sponsor kids or a kid program? And we would – and I made it old school radio. So it was broken down into different sections. So kids would the kids would learn about stop sets, about how to – we would did storytelling. We went old school radio and, and, you know, sound effects, all of that. How to pick the music for the show. How to – like all the different facets of radio – and then in the end, it created a one hour show and we would broadcast, we broadcasted it live from family and company where I used to work. And so I just called in all my resources at that time. And it was just, it was an amazing experience because I'll tell you from those kids that went to the camp, I think I've had, oh, about, about four or five of them came back. They actually went into radio and they wrote me years later when they're now adults. Many of them are married now, which makes me feel old, but they wrote me and told me how that changed them and what an amazing experience it was. This three day camp. And then it would extend. We'd have we'd have alumni, we'd have a Christmas show or we'd have a special show that we would invite the kids back and they would voice commercials for the for the sponsors and they would do interviews and but it it was such a cool experience. So then from there, so radio, I ended up leaving and I saw something about working on a cruise ship. And I applied for it. And then before I knew it, I was down in Florida at an audition. And again, that sort of sense of sales and performance and, 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 and entertaining, I guess, just I really fell in love with it. So everything sort of like these ideas pop into my head. Like when I was in school, I ended up doing my internship in Africa because everybody else was going to Toronto. And I thought, well, that's kind of boring. I just thought it was like everybody else is, and I'm not going to get in. Are you going to get a job out of it? What's going to happen? Do, is that the path you want to take? And I thought, I know if I go to Africa, I won't necessarily get a job, but it will be one hell of an experience. And it was, I ended up getting a connection through a friend that was an actor at the theater whose best friend's father was a doctor and he was working in Africa opening up a medical facility in a third world country. He had a connection to CNN and then that's how I got in. It's crazy. Like it's just, I think if people open themselves up to their network and the possibilities, instead of thinking like, Oh, I don't know if I can do that. Rather think like, how do I make that happen? Then you just, you just go and you do it. You just touched on what I was going to ask you next. And that is about what I'll call mindset that, and <laughs> You took the term right out of my mouth, focusing on possibility. It sounds to me like everything that you've described indicates that you've had a pretty strong sense of connection with your own intuition and haven't gotten in your way a whole lot. Now, maybe there are a whole bunch of stories that, you, <laughs> that you're just not leading with of times when you did get in your way, but so many of us, yours truly at the front of the line held themselves or, or continue to hold themselves back because they listen to that limiting belief of why it won't work or why it can't or why you shouldn't or any of those kinds of things. Have you always been kind of naturally predisposed to just thinking about like chasing the possibility and going after it with most things? For the, for the most part. I mean, I, I'm like, I've been scared of things like just like anybody else. Right. But I think if you put yourself in the in the moment and i saw an interview the other day and i thought it was really it really resonated with me and you know when i was doing the weather people said well, what if you're wrong and i said well i could be wrong but as long as i believe it, it it doesn't matter because if i can convey that story to you as an audience and i'm telling that story about what's going to happen and i believe it's going to happen so it's sort of that i don't want to say fake it until you make it but you have to believe it. You can't just, if you're going to talk the talk and walk, you, you really do have to walk that walk. With, even with anybody that we film in front of a camera, I always really focus on their passion, their values, and their expertise. And for me, I think, yeah, there's times I've been scared. Like, the whoa, when I started as a weather anchor, I was terrible. I was so terrible. It was, I was awful. I'm surprised I got the job. I'm surprised I got to keep the job. But, but... Uh, oh, uh, sorry. But I, but in the end, the more you practice, the better you get at anything. So I think even practicing that sense of going after what it is you want, the more you do it, it just becomes second. You don't, you don't question yourself anymore. You just do it. 
Tell me, I can't resist. Tell me a story, if you could, or if you can recall one, Melissa, of an example of what made you feel like you were so terrible when you were doing the weather. Did you you wear a green dress and get chroma keyed out at the midsection or something like that? That was actually when my audition. Uh. (laughs) Seriously, I was coming back from from working on cruise ships, and I remember Brent Hansen calling me at CKCO, telling me, I don't know what it was with me in maternity leave positions, but I got the job because of that at the radio station. I got the job in in weather because somebody went on a mat leave and he said, Melissa, see, I try to get in TV for years. It's hard in a local, in a local market, right? Until there's an opportunity. And it turned out that somebody was leaving and he he called me in and I went in for the audition. I was super pumped, but I'd always been in front of a blue screen. So the naivety of me, like I wasn't even thinking, duh, green screen. So I had a green outfit on. I was a floating head. You couldn't see anything (laughs) on my head and my hands and nothing else. I was completely mortified because I can see myself in the screen as they're recording this and I'm going, Oh my God, I'm just a gong. This is a gong show. Um, They're just going to put me on their laugh track, you know, and (laughs) play me, play me at their Christmas show probably. Uh, But he was either really desperate or he took a chance on me and I appreciated it immensely because I did get the job and I had, you know, my time at Kitchener, it was interesting. But then when I moved to London and I really spent a lot of time, I mean, it changed names a lot before I went back, the new PL, uh, uh, oh gosh, it had so so many different names before it became CTV again in London. But that was where I met Jay Campbell, and Jay became an amazing meteorologist mentor to me. And his see, I think really importantly, one one thing I hold near and dear is I always say you become like the people you spend the most time with. That to me is pivotal. Is like weed out the people that make you feel bad about yourself or that that you just, that don't bring you to a higher level. And Jay was, he would greet you and you would always say to him, Hey Jay, how's it going today? And he would say his favorite word is super kaduper. <laughs> like, I love the man. He's amazing. Like super kaduper. He had the best attitude and he was so smart in weather, but just I loved his personality so much. And he was, you know, he was your grandfather. He was that guy next door. Everybody remembered Jay. And when he retired, he just had a parade of people that that came to his retirement party because of that. So for me, it's about surrounding yourself with the right people. And and I have a, I'm really, really lucky that I have a network of like two really amazing parents that have supported me. And uh, we became a very strong family unit. Like we all especially with my sister's challenges. So I think that really helped me become the person I am, more empathetic, more compassionate, more caring as an individual to the, to what's important to me and the people that I want to help and the people around me. You know, like kids to me are, are really, really important. And, um, and having my own now has really changed me too, even again. If I can offer a quick story, just since you mentioned Jay Campbell. <clears throat> yeah. Well, well. Somebody that's listening on the other side of the world right now won't have any idea who we're talking about. But Jay was for a long, long time, decades, um, the local weather anchor at, in the city that Melissa and I are talking about, London, Ontario, Canada. And you talked earlier, Melissa, about doing the weather and, well, what if you're wrong? <laughs> so, yeah. Because yeah. there are people that are relying on that information, right? Well, for a brief time in my career, I was the general manager of a NASCAR-sanctioned stock car track called Delaware Speedway, Yeah, where we would have events, which were, of course, outdoors, uh, every Friday night. And the nightmare scenario for us was, if there was a possibility of rain anywhere within a several hundred mile radius, because there were competitors and fans and sponsors and staff and that came from this whole elliptical area, so it didn't even matter if it was just this city or the adjacent towns, it was better if it would just be a complete washout than a maybe because then we wouldn't know what to do. Yeah. And Jay didn't know me from from a hole in the ground, but it's funny what you carry with you and what you remember. And I just remember carrying around all this stress and not knowing what to do. And I remember one day just thinking, I don't, I'm, I'm basically, I have to guess here uh, and affect the fortunes of all of these other people. I have to guess at what's going to happen with this weather. And I called into the TV station and I asked if I could talk to Jay. That's awesome. And, uh, and of course, he called me back and was just, I don't think he said, what was the term? Super D- Super Kadooper. Super Kadooper. 
<laughs> I don't know if that's in the Oxford Dictionary, but it should be. <laughs> but he um, was completely pleasant and had said, you know, and he's preparing for the evening news and had said, anytime that you, you need me, call me back and made me feel, you know, you don't like to put on other people, but I probably called him three or four times during the course of that season. And um, I don't remember the specific outcomes of any of those predictions, but I remember as soon as you say his name, that sort of tuning fork in my spirit goes off of just, there's a kindness and a compassion that it really doesn't take a whole lot. And I'm guessing this, to turn it right back around into your story, is is some of the stuff that must translate into what you would encourage your clients to do in terms of who they are and, and how they come across of we're trying to come up with these fancy marketing slogans and gimmicks and tricks where nothing can really be as powerful as just being who you are. Oh, because you know what? Because that that's the kind of guy he is and he was when he was at the station. And you you know being in the broadcast world, to be honest, TV is – there. Growing up, I always had there was this this magic, like I said, with my grandfather with a video camera, there was that magical part of that. I thought going into radio was very magical. I thought going into TV was very magical. And then you work in it and then you go, huh, people aren't as nice as you thought they'd be. And it, it's not as magical as you thought it would, you know, you know, and, and but there are some people like Jay that every day bring the right attitude to the table and those are the people you want to work with. And it was one of the reasons why I ended up leaving. Everybody asked me, why did you leave the TV station? Why did you, why did you leave? And it was getting to the point. You could kind of see the writing on the wall. And again, it was like I wanted to make the decision before the decision was made for me. And that was important to me. But again, working with Jay was such a gift because there aren't very many weather jobs out there. And to work with him was so unique because again you know like how many weather anchors really are there in southwestern ontario let alone across canada there aren't that many positions so it's a pretty cool thing to have done and to have had for sure what parts of what you do now do you still find the most magical it's the aha moment it's working with clients and especially when i'm working with groups and speaking and they will take you know, the, a little nugget of what I've said and apply it to their jobs, uh, to apply it to their businesses. And when something happens and they have what I call an aha moment, it's like, oh, you know that thing you told me to do? It really works. Oh, my gosh. And then when they make more money and they have more sales and people talk about them and then they say, well, who told you that to do that or who did that for you? And then and then when they say Melissa did or MS, that was an MS2 project, for, that's the magic for me because that just – it just makes my day. Absolutely. It, it's helping people in a different way. So it still fulfills the performance side of things, the sales and marketing, because it's, but it's making a difference. And that's what I'm all about now. Everything I do, I just, I do it to make a difference, whether it's make someone's day, grow someone's bottom line, help someone be better in front of the camera, help them to present themselves better. Uh, you name it. But it, now I can really, position everything that I do is about making a difference tell me about the name I've been meaning to ask you and I always keep forgetting whenever I see you but MS2 Productions what's this <laughs> well do you want the story that I tell everyone or do you want the actual story yeah well you kind of um, you kind of have the opportunity I, I, to do both right now yeah yeah well okay so MS okay so Here's, uh, I don't think I've ever told this story publicly before, but um, so MS2, Melissa Shank, obviously the two goes back to when I worked in, well, when I graduated Fanshawe, I worked at a forklift company uh, called HMS Equipment Sales and I met a fellow by the name of Michael Salter and Michael Salter and I fell madly in love and uh, we, we decided within three days we were going to be engaged. Like this is this. Yeah. So we, um, we were together, we dated for a long time and in the end, lo and behold, it didn't work out, but I had registered this company as MS2. We were going to be partners in it, but then I ended up keeping the name, changing to a sole proprietorship. And I just thought there was something about it that I thought, nope, I'm going to do this. And I want to, I want to grow it, make it big. And, uh, so that's actually where the MS2 came from. It was two people's names put together, but now, um, it's funny. My team comes up with all of these like media savvy marketing specialists, making social media simple. We've come up with so many MSs through the course of 
almost 20 years in business. Like I'm going on my 18th year, I believe. So almost 20 years. And, uh, but that, yeah, it's changed. We've had both three logo changes we've rebranded recently. And I think I'm going to stick with this one for a long time. I really like it. Have you ever had a forklift in the logo? No, and there will not be a forklift coming. No, 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 no. But yeah, I did mark. It started because I was hired at Fanshawe when I went to school there to do their marketing, and they were a client. And then that company hired me to do their marketing for them. And then, for, like, it's just always been a domino effect for me. Kind of, it's just one thing kind of has led to another. So tell me about how that company and the various pieces of it has evolved um, from that time to now. How's that for a broad question? <laughs> Oh, so how the how the piece like what did the, you start with when you had the company and you're okay I've got this business what were some of the initial things that you were doing and then maybe you can take it from there of how different pieces kind of were added on or maybe fell away but how mm. it evolved well you know the one thing I really learned was in the beginning remember when I said to you in radio that I wanted to be able to offer everything to everyone yeah. so hey we don't just do radio we can do billboards we can do websites we can do video we can do anything you know what do you need what do you need we did that for a long time and then I realized I was like micromanaging people because you can't do everything so what I've changed now in my business is that uh, we do one thing very well and I do and it all starts with the power of video now I am very blessed like I didn't have the 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 sight to see in the future to know that video online is was going to go where it was going to go and so all of my marketing always starts with the power of video my speaking engagements everything so I teach people about it I teach people the science behind it the psychology behind it everything about that fascinates me um, so that really sort of changed dramatically but it grew so when I worked at the tv station in Kitchener I remember one fellow that I used to work with at the radio station went there too and he introduced me to someone and then we th we went for dinner one night and we said oh my gosh we'd be great to, like you're really good at this I'm really good at this and so we partnered and we worked together for about 10 years and they he's since gone and has his own company now and that's great they're doing fabulous and stuff but you know it's kind of that that analogy too people come into your life for a season or reason or a lifetime and it's wonderful to see other people grow and accomplish their goals and dreams and and I think you can never hold it against anybody for wanting to to do what they want to do and accomplish what they want to accomplish because everyone beats to the rhythm of their own drum, right? And everyone's got their own agenda. And sometimes if somebody doesn't say yes to you, it just doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean that they don't like what you're planning. It's just maybe you don't fit into their plan, right? So it, it's really kind of a that's that's been a real learning curve, I think, through the years is the biggest thing is doing one thing and doing it really, really well. Because even when I worked at the TV station, I used to think the secret to success was light lots of little fires. So if, not figuratively, but you know, business-wise, light lots of little fires so that if one goes out, you still have the other ones to rely on. So I had my business, the video marketing agency. I worked in television and we didn't even get to this yet. I used to teach at Conestoga College. So I had all these things going on. And so on the weekend, it was like weather anchor, put your other hat on, you know, Monday morning, 5 a.m., get in the car, drive to Kitchener, put your teaching hat on for a couple of days. Then you still had all your clients and everything. And by that time, I I've sometimes forgot what hat I was wearing to the point that I realized that, you know what, again, life is short and I want to do one thing and do it really, really well. And what I noticed, this was really interesting, was the moment I said, I, the moment I quit the TV station and I quit teaching and I put all the emphasis into the business, I grew the business substantially because all the effort went there. How scary or not was that to make that decision at the time? Well, it was, you know, it, I was established and I think the things I do too with the business, it, it may be very different from a, from a video marketing agency is we're not just, I'm not just an agency. I love the fact that I can go in and educate and teach and speak and do what I love to do. So I still do that, but I can also, you can go and do it yourself. Or if you want someone to do it for you, I can do that for you too. So again, I practice what I preach on a daily basis with all of our clients. And it's really cool because we have great case studies from our clients so that when I do teach it, I can use them as examples to say, hey, this is what's going on. And it's also promoting them to different markets and exposing them. So it's a really win-win situation. Tell me about your fascination of, you mentioned the psychology of, of video and yeah. how it fascinates you. 
Tell me a little bit more about that. To me, okay, so there are so many things that people don't think about when, oh, I have to make a video. Everyone just, you know, I tell, everyone tells me I need to make a video. But when, okay, here, here's one thing, for instance, for psychology. When someone can see your face and hear your voice, like, they, like when I delivered the weather, and then they see you in person, they have that aha moment. They're like, you're that guy, you're that guy. So for me, it was always, I would just was weather girl. That's why everything, my Twitter handle, everything I'm MS2 weather girl, because I'm going to be 80 years old and people are still going to say, Hey, weather girl. It was like, I drove through a drive through probably two weeks ago. And someone said, oh, I saw you given the weather the other day. That was so great. I'm thinking I haven't done that for years, but thank you. <laughs> like, <laughs> so it's amazing the tricks that your mind will play on you. But the really cool part in business, I look at this is like, you could be making money while you're sleeping because the decision factor, when people are making a decision about you, they're, we do Canadians, as, especially as Canadians, we do our research more than any other uh, nationality. Like we, and I know this from the shopping channel, like the difference between Canada and the U.S. Can, Americans will buy things a lot more, a lot faster without thinking. Um, Canadians do their due diligence and really research a product. So they go online. Well, they're going to research you. So you have to have content online. So when someone can see your face and hear your voice, they build a trust. They build, um, it's called triggers of influence. So again, psychologically, I want to think about likability, authenticity, social proof, all of these different things. But then when they meet you in person, you aren't worried about Oh, you know, making that impression, you already did. You're closing the deal. They're just making sure what they see is what they get because they've already met you and have, have pre a preconceived notion of you. Similarly, so that's why sometimes when you, when you meet a Hollywood celebrity and you've built this up in your mind, it's a very similar situation, even with me doing the weather. Hey, weather girl, oh my gosh. Oh. You know, so that's why sometimes people would say, oh, it was not what I thought, or they were disappointing, or what you see isn't what you got on the TV screen. Um, same kind of goes for people's business. When you build up and you build a great commercial for them, or you build a great video for them, or, or a radio spot, and then they go in and they have maybe a disappointing experience. You've done all this work. It, it, I mean, business today is challenging because there's a lot you've got to do to get people in the door. But when you get them in the door, you want to keep them. And the way you keep them is, is like you, you nailed it on the head earlier. It's about being you. And psychologically, the big thing too, like when social media first came out, I remember speaking right across well, Canada afterwards, like first Ontario and then across Canada. But the thing that would always resonate for business owners, they would say, Oh, I want business to be business and I want personal to be personal, especially with Facebook, right? Like a Facebook page and a, a, a personal page and a business page. To me, in this day and age, that does not exist. People want to know you. People buy from people they like, know, and trust. And it, they, if you just let people into your world, that's the secret sauce. That's it. Be you. That really makes a difference. How much resistance do you get <clears throat> I'm trying to think of how to ask this because I've got two different arms to it in my mind. Both how much resistance did you maybe get when you are talking to business people? And I, I mean, okay, so Melissa, you and I are talking. We've both got media backgrounds. We both speak. We both could talk forever if, uh, if you know, our batteries yeah, never ran yeah. out <laughs> and if somebody yeah. would, would listen. But for people that are maybe more behind the scenes or they don't consider themselves personalities, um, and now you rock it in and you're talking about the psychology of video, that initial, what I would think would be a natural inclination to resist about, oh, I'm not going on camera. But then the next phase that I was thinking about it too, if we can bring them together, is even really understanding the aspect of, of who they are and, and as an extension, who the business is. And, and to give some context and not take the conversation over, but I've worked with so many small, medium-sized businesses on their marketing and we'll have these great conversations and they'll tell me all the reasons why they're different from all their competitors. But then when it comes down to how they communicate and represent their business through marketing or through their social channels or whatever, it always gets distilled down back to what it mirrors what everybody else is doing, which yeah. just basically loses their message in the wind. So I'm sort of listening to what you're saying and I'm thinking, boy, here are two almost automatic objections of I'm not going on camera and I'm not going to, you know, go out on a limb and actually say who I really am. But how does yeah. that look with, with the people that you work with? 
Oh, I tell people right away, get over it, get <laughs> over it because seriously, because, Oh, I'm afraid. I don't want to be in front of the camera. I don't like it. And, and I'm just like, yeah, but you have so much to gain. You have so much. And when they do it, that that's again one of those magical moments that happens and they and they overcome it and they go oh my i can't believe it. wow this is this wasn't as hard as i thought it would be but and sometimes yeah you know what your first time in front of a camera isn't going to be as great as your 10th time but nowadays i just tell people stop thinking about it and start doing it the, the longer they think and stew about it the harder it gets right and that's with anybody i mean my thing right now i really want businesses and I, fi- and I found this. I've had people, the, the average time for people to get up off their butt to actually do it was like five years. Corporations, yeah, we'll do a video. We'll th- we're thinking about it. We're going to meet about meeting about it. You know, but you can't wait any longer because the longer you wait, the more your competition is going to have videos online. The videos stay there. The longer they're there, the more they get into the Google search engines. And you just get further and further and further behind. I mean, now we're in live streaming world. We're in... So not only having a video, but it's not just about one video. It's about being present and and publishing on a regular basis and getting people getting to know you. So I, t- I really honestly tell people now, let's get past that and let's just get down to business and have some fun with it and do it. And you'll realize how it can work and how you can't get it can't work unless you unless you start doing it right like anything stop thinking about it and just do the work well when you started to describe that a moment ago about uh, you know the first time you do it isn't going to be you're going to get better as you go on to the fifth the sixth the eighth the tenth time i'm thinking i wonder if she tells uh, people the story about how she was when she started doing the weather oh, yeah. <laughs> as, as yeah. a floating head but it's kind oh. of the same example isn't it all the time, all the time. And you know, the greatest gift I take away now, and to be honest, people said, why didn't, why did you go into weather? Well, I know because it was the position that was offered. But again, I look at it as, as this amazing gift because the difference between a reporter and a weather anchor is that I ad lib, I'm not a writer. So, I mean, I, I, I have the story planned out, but it's not word for word for word. If you watch a reporter, and I find this really fascinating, do you ever see them when they're live on location and they have their notebook and they sometimes stumble because they are so used to being, here's my intro, it cuts to the story, practice, they've practiced, they've got it down, but when they're live, sometimes they don't think on their feet as fast as they could because they're not uh, trained to do that. They, they just don't do that day in and day out. Whereas a story, t- whereas with weather, you build the boards, you figure out a story, you know where you're going to go, but you never quite know how you're going to get there. You just know you got to get out there in two minutes and 30 seconds. And that really has helped me as a speaker, as um, like with everything I do. So it was a really good gift. So I tell people something they should really practice if they want to do public speaking or just like even just being in front of a camera, especially live streaming right now get out and speak, just learn how to speak without having to always be, you know, word for word for word on a piece of paper. Just talk. What are the, some of the things that you encourage business people to do in the video, the kinds of content? Because it's one thing to say, okay, well, you need to be on video, which I agree with, and we could do two hours just on that. But in terms of, okay, I, I agree with you, Melissa, I hear you. Now what? Dep- okay, so it depends on the business, but I always break it down like we're working with a security company right now, for instance. Now, some of the stuff is sure, it's like demo pieces and show and tell, but what are things that make you, the business or the business owner, different? So one, they really should, there should be something about you that gets people to know, you know, like what we're doing today. You know, there are stories I've told you that I've never told anybody else, right? Um, but that's the kind of secret stuff. What's the, what is something or the things that your audience, if they walked into your location today, wouldn't get to see? Give your customers VIP treatment. So they're giving them a reason to tune into you. Because if they already know everything that you're telling them, well, that's, you know, there's different reasons for having videos. Obviously, there are new customers that don't know anything about you. But what about those repeat customers that you want to develop that lasting relationship with? You want to give shareable content. So 
you want to give people things to talk about and um, position yourself as an authority figure. So I always go back to three things and I call them the three touch points of customer engagement. And they're, they're really simple, but it's your values, your passion, and your expertise. So if your content does not fall into one of those three categories, passion, values, or expertise, so things that are important to you, things you're really excited about, or things that you're really knowledgeable about, then don't include it because it's not important. So it, that, that's really how I, how I start the content um, delivery. And then I go backwards as well. And I start, and then I ask that question, how do you want to be remembered? What do you want to be known for? So that develops your personality. Are you an authority figure? Are you coming to them as their friend? Are you coming to them as um, that reporter type person that, that knows everything about the products? So you're developing a character, if you will. And I think nowadays, like what I'd like to see in the school system is not so much them saying, hey, you're going to graduate and go into a TV station, but rather, hey, you're going to go into a business and you are going to be the producer of that corporation of their TV channel. Because I think every business nowadays is should be their own delivery station and should have um, like their own YouTube channel and Facebook page. And it's like an adventure to come in and tune into them. Yeah, that's really interesting observation. Um, I can see that going that way within the next uh, couple turns of whatever generations are coming up, because in the world that I've been working in helping people with, with marketing, primarily in radio, but in, in digital areas as well over the last half decade or so from the time that we're recording this. People are slowly starting to wake <laughs> up when I talk about, you know, their email lists or the the database that they have of people that subscribe on YouTube. I'm, I can think of one off the top of my head, Melissa, the shop that does installation of uh, different car audio systems and security systems and lighting and stuff like that. And they've got a following of over 10,000 people on their YouTube channel. And I have stood in that shop in London, Ontario, when there have been calls from other continents because somebody is having an issue that they think this guy that does the videos who will just take the camera and just show in the show. Here's what I'm working on. Here's what kind of wiring I'm using. This is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Now, at the last time I saw them, I, I wanted to grab them and shake them. What you have here is a distribution channel, you know, oh my 10, God. thousand people that have said, I want your content. It's yeah. incredible. Yeah. And this massive opportunity and see the biggest difference right now is business owners are not necessarily wanting to put themselves in front of the camera. You look at the YouTubers out there that are this millennial generation that they will be beauty bloggers. They'll go out, they'll make videos on, you name it. They've got it. They've nailed it. But the pro the, the, the cool opportunity, I think that can resonate right now with businesses is that in that world, not many people are doing it. So if you jump on the bandwagon now, you are going to put yourself in a class of one in your business sector because it hasn't, re even though there are millions and billions of views a day, there are only certain people, like it's individuals as opposed to businesses going after this. So for example, okay, so years ago we did some uh, videos on a website called Expert Village, and they were how to videos. Even if you teach people, like people will say to me, Well, no, no one's going to want to listen to what I have to say. Yes, they will. They just, you haven't put it out there for them to listen to yet, right? So years ago, we did a 15 part series on literally how to paint stripes on a wall. So we, there was like how to pack for a cruise ship, anything we, I was an expert in, right? So how to paint stripes on a wall. I thought, I can do that. So I put this video out, and a fellow, this is when YouTube kind of first came out and a fellow from uh, St. Louis, Missouri Kate gave me a call. His name's Phil Menendez. And he said, Hey, Melissa, I saw you painting stripes on YouTube. How are you? It was weird. It was really weird, but people do their research, right? The psychological factor we were talking about earlier, they do their research. It traced him back. That traced it to me. He got a hold of my phone number. He called me and he said, Melissa, I saw you painting stripes on YouTube. I saw you doing it the old way. I've created the new way, the use stripe it way. And, you know, would you be willing to try this product? And I thought, well, okay, what have I got to lose? He said, if you like the product, will you be the face of the product? And will you help me make a commercial? And will you, will you help me sell the product? So, okay, that, that totally went in a completely different direction, right? He, St. Louis, Missouri flies to... Southwestern Ontario, there's got to be a company that does just what I do there. But he came to Southwestern Ontario because he saw that video and he built that trust in me. And to this day, we've 
we've uh, been connected and friends and we've gone to hardware sh- like home shows and in Las Vegas and he's been on the Rachel Ray show and he's done all these cool things and like you just never know that's that's magical to me I saw you painting stripes on YouTube. I like I literally because <laughs> the cool part was he was a former DEA agent and 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 at that time I had just finished doing a drug documentary for Perth County because Stratford was uh, or Perth County was the second highest for crystal meth in Canada. I don't know if you remember that quite a few, like maybe 5 or 6 years ago. So uh even long, no, it was longer ago, but it was about the same time. So he tells me he's this former DEA agent. He got electrocuted in a marijuana drug bus because he got electrocuted in a basement in a pool of water and he couldn't do it anymore. So he had to go back to the family business, which was painting stripes and or painting. And he said, people don't want all the, all the additional pieces like chevrons and stripes because it takes longer and they don't want to pay for it. So he had to come up with this tool. That's how it started. That's crazy. It's funny how life works out, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I was meaning to ask you, and you sort of touched on both ends of it in what you were just saying, but how much of what you're doing with your clients is kind of on the coaching side of empowering them with the ideas and the tools and the encouragement to produce their own material versus how much is, is actually the production where you're doing, whether it's you know the on-air part of it or that plus – the post-production and the editing and all, how does that kind of balance out for you these days? Well, it's kind of, I, it's almost 50, 50 in the sense that I think everyone needs to have, everyone feels really confident when they have a professional piece and a polished piece. That's your first impression, right? And especially if we're dealing with, I don't care if it's, if it's a, a small single entrepreneur or, and not to say a single entrepreneur would be small. You could have a massive business, but we're a large corporation but it's it you you have to kind of think about your uh you know your background and how you want to be represented how you want to be seen and thought of again how do you want to be remembered so to have that professional polished piece or pieces right out of the bandwagon have that there but it's also then forgiving to be having those necessarily not polished pieces when you're out live somewhere it's it's kind of like, I always like to start with the professional first and then it's like you graduated and you can go off and you can do it and you can do it on your own as well. So I always encourage everyone to be able to make their own videos on their cell phone. And so it's, it's kind of 50, 50, we get you started, but it's like, it's like a little bird. You, you fly away and and you can do it too, you know? And then people come back and we work with them and we consult and we, people get better and they ask, what do you think about this or how can I improve? And, and we help them with that. Yeah. It blows my mind, Melissa. I remember using these big, this big bulky three quarter inch tape machine when I went through radio yes. and TV arts. Yes. Uh, yeah. And the, and the, and I would spend hours and hours like you I was good in front of the camera, but they would just kick me out at night because I would just forever be editing. I would take this camera out to all of the high school sports games and then I would edit together highlights. And I just, I love that creative part of it. And I remember the, the old graphics generator that was this, just this behemoth of a machine. And now I can do the same things literally with a free app on my cell phone. I'm watching my 14 year old son who makes videos for his own YouTube channel, where if my 14 year old kid has over a thousand subscribers for, he's figured out things that I literally went to school to learn how to do. He's just taught himself. It's astounding, isn't it? It, You know, it really is. And I remember people always ask me about school. And I thought my dream in high school was I wanted to go to Ryerson and I was going to go to radio and television arts. And I was going to take that four year program. And I remember going for a tour and I asked the, I asked one of the teachers there how it all worked. And I remember him saying, Oh, the first year you study radio, the second year you study television, the third year you pick which one you like better, you specialize. And the fourth year you actually get to touch something. And I thought, Oh my goodness, I'm not wasting my time. So I went to call, co- I went to college instead because everyone thought, well, why didn't you go that? Why didn't you go there? I'm really of the, of the philosophy now that a lot of the stuff can be self-taught in my in this industry the passion's really there if the passion's there you can really get out there and learn it um it's just a matter of how much time do you have versus what do you what do you want to spend your time on like people say to me oh can you teach me how to edit 
I don't even like to edit. I have editors for that because that's not my area of expertise. I have the creativity. I have the, the, the passion of like, I can see it. And then they're the ones that push all the buttons and make it happen. Cause I don't have the patience for, to sit there for it. Right. So it's a matter of kind of figuring out what you're good at, what you want to spend your time on. But yeah, it's amazing. And if you look at the TV stations nowadays, seeing someone the other day, they're, they're shooting on, it looks like a consumer camera. They're editing on iPads. It almost, to me, in some ways, it lacks credibility, to be honest. When you see it from a distance and it, it just no longer are they the big cameras on their shoulders anymore. And I joke with them. I'm like, well, I guess you don't have the back problems that you used to have because the camera guys would always be going, you know, off to chiropractors or masseuses because they'd always have sore backs because of the camera gear being so heavy. It's funny how it it evolves. I know exactly what you mean. Um, before we wrap up, I have to ask you, you've given us – so many ideas of your many various adventures, but one thing that we haven't touched on yet was the uh, the best job in the world competition. And oh, I'm just yeah. I'm thinking that there's at least a story or two in there that um, <laughs> that you probably would feel would be worth sharing before we wrap up. Can I ask yeah. you to tell us about that? Yeah, you know what? That was again one of those magical moments, and there are times in my career where it's just I can't really explain it, but you just kind of you just have a feeling that you have to do something for a reason. And this was one of those moments. And I was sitting at my, at the TV station about to deliver the weather. I was so into what was going on that night with whatever was happening in my weather world. I didn't know about the story and I heard Dan talking about it. He presented it and my, you know, your ears perked up and I went, well, that's really interesting. Okay, back up so a I, second. Just for, mm -hmm. sorry to interrupt you, but for, yeah. to pretend that people that are listening have no idea what we're talking about and maybe oh fill in some right of the blanks. right right okay so this is now oh my gosh so best job was about seven years ago now six seven years ago so tourism queensland had a competition and it was called the best job in the world competition and you could be the island caretaker and you could go and live in australia for I believe it was six months you got x amount of dollars you lived in beautiful surroundings and your job your role was to be the island caretaker and report about all the things you would do so you had to report about all the islands this is when social media really took off and it was one of those things where you go oh gosh this would be of course the best job in the world but i looked at it as more of a business opportunity to say okay do what they said. You had to submit a video, but I, but everybody was submitting very similar videos. And I said to my team, I said, we have to, we have to enter this because I want to prove we know how, we know how to make this happen and we know how to get selected. And we did out of, it was out of 37,000 videos. We started in the top 50 when they did the top 50 selection. And then we got to the top 10 online. Um, we didn't win. And I knew we would never win because a contest like that wants, would want to, um, would want to have somebody that they could be their marketing tool, right? They're not going to want a marketing agency or company to be that person. But, uh, it was all about being different and giving them what they wanted and listening to the, to the, their needs versus 95% of the Canadians that applied, uh, put on a bathing suit, went out in the snow because it was the winter and said, pick me, pick me. And if you think about it, like they're in Australia, they see people in bathing suits every day and it, it didn't stand out and it wasn't original. 37,000 videos. How much of a one minute video do you think they're going to, they're going to watch all of it or click, 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 click. Oh, oh, that's different. That caught my eye. So that was the reason why we did it. But then it was really cool because then I think uh, we got I got to go to a conference in California, met up with some of the other finalists. And to this day, I'm still friends with some of them. So that was a really cool experience that I, I think back to a lot. And I'm working on a project right now that eventually might get me to Australia. So it's still on the bucket list that I haven't got there. And to have traveled on, worked on cruise ships and to have been to Africa and have not made it to Australia yet, that is high on the bucket list right now. And I'm hoping that that one can be checked off pretty soon. I'm curious before we let this go completely, what was it that if everybody else or so many of them out of the 37,000 are just running out into the snow in their bathing suits, pick me, pick me, what was it or some of the things that you did to deliberately be different to catch the attention in that first few seconds? Well, I used the TV station one night and I used the green screen and uh, and then I used the the idea of working on a cruise ship and I remembered the phone ringing and it was something along the lines like, 
I've, oh, I, I don't remember it word for word, but basically I've got it. They need that. They want this. Okay, let's do it. And, and it was becoming their island caretaker. And so I basically went through the list of demands of everything they wanted. And it became a sales piece to promote the, all of the different facets of the things and the locations that they wanted. So it wasn't so much about me, but it was the whole thing, not what, what, I, what they can do for me, but what I can do for you. Right. So in the, in the delivery, it was all about promoting tourism Queensland as their Island caretaker. So I became the Island caretaker as a character in the commercial or in the presentation, as opposed to, Hey, it's Melissa Shank. I already own the position and was that, was that character for them for it. Brilliant. And, and, and made a, and made a piece for it. So like, ah, I'm that, you know, I'll feed the fish, I'll clean the pool, I'll do the, all the things that they had. And then I just, I did all those things. So instead of saying, hi, I'm Melissa, please hire me. Uh, it, it, it went on and said, you know, I've, I've got weather experience. I was a competitive swimmer. I did all these things, but I again was the Island caretaker as opposed to Melissa. That's a cool story. And to make it to the top 10 out of that many, what did you say? 37,000, something like yeah, that. Uh, it, was pretty, it was pretty cool. It was, and, and the kicker of it was again on a Saturday night, I remember coming home for dinner, working at the TV station and that's, I think it was like seven o'clock or something. They were about to release it and they, they made an error online. They put up the 50 faces of the people that had been selected. And I can remember like, saying some interesting remarks because I remember seeing some of the, well, I remember seeing some of the faces going that video. Are you kidding me? That it wasn't even, but they, but it was like, um, like a, a false read and then it, and a trigger switched and the real ones came up. I felt, I felt so bad because those people thought would have thought that they'd been selected and they weren't and it switched and it was a whole different 50 people. Hmm. And then I was there and then, but I've, you've never seen someone go from zero to a hundred and so fast in the course of a couple seconds that I won't forget either. As we round third and wrap this up and give you some quiet moments before your son wakes up, I'm curious about what are, and you've already given a couple of indications of some bucket list things, but I'm thinking about things that are maybe a little bit more immediate that I'm getting the impression, Melissa, you've always got a few things percolating, maybe over on the side, just waiting to go into production. And when I say into production, I don't necessarily mean editing video, but an idea uh, whose time just hasn't quite met with your path. But what are some of the things that, that, that charge you up, you think about maybe adding to your experience in the, in the next few years, perhaps? Well, really soon. I said this year I'm, I'll be 40 in October and I've been meaning to, like everybody else, write a book. So that's on the list of it's going to be done soon. And it's about different, how different makes a difference in business and using a lot of uh, business stories, things from my past, how telling some of the stories, you know, we chatted about today, but a whole lot more about attitude and how that can make a whirlwind of difference and just making certain decisions uh, have gotten us have gotten me to there and how it can do the same for other business owners, like simple, simple things that people don't realize that will make a world of difference in their business. So, you know, the books are really big part of it and, um, getting back into traveling as well. I think Australia is at the top of that list. Um, and doing a lot more teaching too. Cause it, when I see the difference it makes in business owners and how that's shifted a lot of businesses with the coaching, it's, uh, it really just, again, it's kind of tapped into that magical moment for me once again. Melissa, it's been so great to spend this time. It always goes by so fast. I could ask you a million more questions, but it's funny because we've, uh, I've been fortunate enough to share your company a handful of times here over the last six months or so, but you know, you set aside one hour, which I think is asking a lot, um, to really explore a journey a little bit more in this format and you can really learn a lot about a person. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time and being so open to sharing. I can't thank you enough and I look forward to seeing you the next time that that happens to happen. Oh, thank you so much, Kevin. I, it's right back at you. I love spending time with you. And you were recently at Mo Mondays. And I love it when we spend time at CAPS together. Uh, just you, uh, your stories are fan, like phenomenal as well. So it's a, it's a win-win situation for sure. Thanks, Melissa. We'll talk soon. Thanks.
You can connect with Melissa on her website at www.ms2.ca. Now that's the number two as opposed to spelling it out. So ms, the number two, dot ca. On social media, you can find her on Facebook at facebook.com slash ms2weathergirl. Instagram, it's the same handle, instagram.com slash ms2weathergirl. And on Twitter, the same thing, twitter.com slash ms 2 Weather Girl, and on YouTube, her channel is ms2.ca. Now, dot spelled all the way out, D-O-T. So youtube.com slash ms2.ca, or just go in there uh, to YouTube and search Melissa Shank. Her last name, by the way, is S-C-H-E-N-K. This is episode 53 of the No Schedule Man podcast, and you can find all of those links on the show notes blog post at No Schedule Man Podcast. Dot com. Now, if you like this episode, you're probably going to like these ones. Episode 50, How I Got So Huggable with Jim Gilbert, Canada's Huggable Car Dealer. Jim Gilbert's Wheels and Deals. Jim and Melissa and I usually recently shared company at a Mo Mondays event, something Melissa has been involved with the last few months here in southwestern Ontario. And Jim's story is a must-listen for any entrepreneur or business owner. Episode 46, you'll also like Soul Centered Sales with Lori Hawkins, a mutual friend of Melissa's and mine, or me. Lori, like Melissa, had a pretty clear idea of some of the principles and values that she held right from the time that she was a little girl. And she tells a great story about how those principles served as a thread that have run through her whole story so far and some really valuable takeaways in Soul Centered Sales with Lori Hawkins. That's episode 46. And episode 44 with our mutual buddy, Michael Doyle. Michael and Melissa worked together at the time of this recording on Mo Mondays London. It's a monthly event that features different speakers. And again, we were all together for part of that in uh, early June of this year. Michael shared his journey in episode 44. It's called Living Fully. And I think that you'll like that a lot. You can find those and all other archived episodes of the No Schedule Man podcast on iTunes or at noschedulemanpodcast.com. While you're there, please do take a moment, subscribe to it. If you like it, you think it will help somebody, share it and leave a comment or a rating or review. That stuff all really helps for, for other people to find it. And I really appreciate that. I'd love to hear from you as well. So don't be a stranger. Leave a comment. Speak up. Let me know what you think, what you like, and what you don't. In the meantime, you can reach me at kevinbolmer.com. No schedule man.com will take you to the same place. All my social media channel links are up there as well, as is the sign-up for my email list. So lots of ways to stay in touch. I'd love for you to do that, and I hope you'll join me on this journey and add your voice to mine. Thanks again for taking the time to listen and for sharing part of your day with me. I'm grateful, and I hope that you'll join me next week as we explore another journey on the No Schedule Man podcast. Just a little deja vu.